since I left Europe the last couple of years, and even started to do while I was here a bit, is starting to think more about interactions between logic and computer science, in particular in foundations of programming language design, and thinking about ways in which the kinds of strange logics that I've spent, at this point, half my life banging my head off of going like, oh, how can I make this logic weirder? And trying to find a way of taking those weird logics and seeing, can these actually be useful in building things? Can these actually go some way to help us solve some practical problems uh, that we might want to solve? And one of the best ways that I think I've come across for potentially doing that is through this angle of type theory. Type theory is a, a discipline that has a lot to do with logic, it's very strongly connected to logic, and particularly to, um, primarily to intuitionistic logic, but with a lot of variance around that sort of area. But it also plays a very important role in certain kinds of programming language design. It's definitely not the case that all programming language design is type theoretically motivated. It's not even the case that most programming language design is type theoretically motivated. But it is definitely the case that some programming language design is type theoretically motivated. And the results that can happen from these motivations are very interesting. So the language that I know the best that's connected uh, to type theory in this way is a language by the name of Haskell. Um, if you're familiar with Haskell, that's great. If you're not, don't worry about it. But here's one of the interesting takeaways from Haskell. If you, Haskell's a programming language. If you write a program in Haskell, and that program exhibits a certain kind of bug, that's considered a bug in the compiler. The language is designed to prevent you from making certain kinds of errors. And prevent in a very, very strong way. Prevent, supposedly, with the certainty of mathematical proof modulo the fact that like lightning can always hit your computer, right? You can't prove that's not going to happen. But the sort of, if everything goes correctly, you're supposed to have a very, very strong guarantee against certain kinds of errors arising. And what's behind that guarantee, once you dig into it, is just good old logical proof, in particular intuitionistic logic. Um, so that's a connection that I find really fascinating. It's a connection that I think might be fruitful. And it's a connection that I'm working more to learn more and more about kind of coming from the logical side into that to try to see, OK, what sorts, of, what sorts of toys can I make out of all the weird logics that I like to play around with? So today will be one example of that. I'll be telling you about core type theory, which is a, a type theoretic approach to a logic called core logic, which is a, a fun, weird logic. OK, so let's start thinking about core logic. Um, it used to be called intuitionistic relevant logic. If you're familiar with any logic under that name, that's the very same logic. It's just a change in name. Um, again, I'm not going to suppose that you are familiar with this, it's just if you happen to be. Um, it's been devised and developed primarily by Neil Tennant, a uh, philosopher at the Ohio State University, or now at the Ohio State University. And as far as I can tell, the first statement of uh, core logic is from 1979. So this has been in development uh, consistently and assiduously for, for decades. Um, it's not that Neil Tennant, it's a different Neil Tennant, um, I think. Um, so here's one presentation of core logic, right? This is a natural deduction presentation. It it's, gives you one way to think about it. Let's just start at the top. I'll walk you through this. You don't need to like remember the details of it, but I want to give you a sense of the flavor of core logic, right? The, the details, to the extent that they matter, I'll remind you of them when they matter. But, uh, but I want you to get a sense of it. So if you start here in the upper left, this is a very normal looking implication introduction rule. Right? This says if you've assumed phi, and from that you've managed to derive yourself of psi, then you may conclude that phi implies psi, discharging your assumptions of phi. You might be familiar with this in different kinds of notations or in different kinds of systems, but this is a really, really common sort of uh, rule for introducing a conditional, for introducing an implication. And 
I note down here in this rule, the discharge may be vacuous. Again, this is, this is usual for intuitionistic kind of systems. All that means is you don't really have to have assumed a phi up here. If you manage to derive your way to a psi any which way, you can count yourself as discharging zero many phi's and conclude that phi implies psi. Um, so that, so far, if you're familiar with natural deduction sort of settings, should look pretty normal. There's nothing out of the usual, out of the ordinary with that. I'm going to try to do this in increasing weirdness. Um, the next place to look is only a little bit out of the ordinary, and it's the, the implication elimination rule. Right, this one, you say, okay, suppose I already have a conditional. Suppose I already know that phi implies psi, how can I go on? Well, one way that you could go on would be if you knew, if you had some other proof of phi, the antecedent, and you had some plan for doing something with a psi. If you could get from psi to theta, you already had a phi, and you had this link that phi implies psi, then you could put all that together and get to theta, and you wouldn't need to assume any psi. Right, because in effect you would have gotten the psi from the modus ponens -y sort of thing. So this is a slightly more complex formulation of modus ponens-like rule. For our purposes today, you can treat it basically like a modus ponens -y rule. Um, the, the variations aren't going to be something that I'll reflect much on in this talk or diplomatic. Um, okay, the other three rules involve this frowny face. Um, time to talk about the frowny face. So part of the motivations behind core logic are tenant's dissatisfaction with, and this is not an idiosyncratic dissatisfaction, I think lots of people are dissatisfied, with the conception of negation that you get from intuitionistic logic. Um, we'll return to this uh, in, the, in the next part of the talk, but I just want to flag, there's a, intuitionistic logic is really organized around proving things, around ruling things in, around giving positive support for things, around demonstrating things, around these sort of yes statuses. And so how do you get a no out of a bunch of yeses? Really hard problem, right? If you're doing negation with truth tables or something, well, you start by helping yourself to notions of truth and falsity. You start by helping yourself to a no, so you can get a no out of it. If you give a theory of negation of the sort that I prefer to give and have given in some of my other work, you start with these speech acts of assertion and denial. Again, you're helping yourself to this negative thing, denial and then you use that to go there. Intuitionistic logic in its usual formulation doesn't have anything negative that it can appeal to, to give an account of negation. And as a result, it gives what a lot of people have thought is a pretty kind of wonky and unsatisfying theory of negation. And you kind of can't conjure a no out of a lot of yeses. And intuitionistic logic does its best to do that, but it really is just its best. It's not, at some point, you just need to steal a no for free. And intuitionistic logic, to its credit, as a principal avoidance of such things, um, but that leaves it with a kind of unsatisfying result. So what Tennant wants to do, you can think of this frowny face. He uses a different symbol for it. I just like frowny faces. Um, you can think of this frowny face as a kind of primitive no. Right? This is a different way of getting a theory of negation up and running, and like all good theories of negation, it does it by taking something negative for granted. The, the thing to be taken negatively for granted here is the frowny face which you can understand as like, something's gone wrong. So, let's start here with negation elimination first. Again, ascending weirdness, right? If um, you've proven the, the negation of phi and you've also proven phi, then something's gone wrong, right? One thing a negation is meant to do is rule out the thing negated. So if you've ruled the thing out and you've ruled the thing in, something's gone wrong. Core logic does turn out to be in an important sense of paraconsistent logic, but it is not a paraconsistent logic because it takes contradiction seriously. It does not take contradiction seriously. If you've come across a contradiction, you get frowny face. Something's gone wrong. Contradictions are, in that sense, ruled out. Um, from there, if you think about negation introduction, if from a phi you can show that something's gone wrong, well, then you can uh, discharge your assumption of phi and conclude not phi. Right, phi would have made something go wrong, therefore not phi. So here's where the, the primitive wrongness comes into the theory of negation, is through these rules. Notice, in this rule, negation introduction, discharge must not be vacuous. Phi itself must have been involved in things going wrong, to use that as a proof of not phi. If things just went wrong for some other reason, you can't thereby conclude not phi. Right? It's only if things go wrong in a phi-involving way that you can conclude not phi. Um, and now finally, the weirdest rule of all, but a fun one, 
back to implication introduction. Right? If things go wrong from a phi, you may conclude that phi implies psi. Um, this is of serious technical convenience. Um, and we'll see the effects it has going forward. For now, I just want to flag it, make sure you notice it. If it feels a little weird to you, good. That suggests you're tracking what's going on here. Um, but let me, let me just note it and, uh, and move forward. And again, that discharge must not be vacuous. Phi has to actually be involved in things going wrong for you to conclude that it implies psi. Uh, OK. As it stands, yes, so yes, yes. Oh, please, so please, 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 please. What's different with intuition? So if you mm -hmm. just replace the frowning face with also? Yep. You would have a weird looking proof system for intuitionistic logic. Yeah, but they would all be, these would all be intuitionally valid rules. Yeah, and yeah, not only would they all be intuitionistically valid, this would be a complete presentation okay. of, right. of the false and arrow fragment, or yeah. maybe the negation false and arrow fragment right. Right. of intuitionistic logic. And in fact, as it stands, although it's weird, this itself is a sound and complete presentation of the negation arrow fragment of intuitionistic logic. Wait, 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 wait but you wouldn't get false of elimination yet, right? You wouldn't get the, of, yeah. the, of the negation arrow okay, fragment okay, okay, of okay, intuitionistic yeah. logic. Um, yep, so with, with, there is no false in this language. <laughs> and importantly, this thing is not a formula, and it is not part of any other formula. There's no such thing as a negation of frowning things. There's no such thing as a conditional involving a frowning thing. There's no formulas that include a frowning face anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a frowning face. <laughs> you get it this way, and you use it those ways. Uh, but there are no formulas that include the frowning face in any way. So this is a proof system where nodes of the proof system can be occupied either by formulas or by the frowning face. And the formulas are in this conditional negation fragment of the language. Um, and it is exactly intuitionistic logic in the conditional negation fragment of the language. To get core logic, Tenet imposes an additional restriction. Um, which is the major premises for elimination must be assumptions. Um, the details here aren't actually going to matter a great deal for us. Um, I just want to flag, though, if you impose that restriction, you do get a weaker logic. Right? It rules out, you don't just remove proofs, that is, proofs that didn't obey that restriction, but actually things become unprovable. There are things that you can prove in the system that you can only prove by violating this restriction. So when you impose the restriction, you really do get a weaker logic. You get one that. Um, okay, let's think about validity in core logic, right? So say that an argument is core valid if and only if there's a core proof that is a proof meeting the extra tenant restriction whose details don't matter for our purposes. But there's a proof meeting the extra restriction whose, and it's a proof of the conclusion and its open assumptions are all among the premises. Then what you have is this is, uh, in some sense, a non-transitive logic. That is, it's not closed under the rule of Ka. Here's an example. From not phi, you can conclude that phi implies psi. Right? So not phi means if I get a phi, something's gone wrong. So let me assume a phi. Something's gone wrong. Well, if from assuming a phi, something's gone wrong, we can use that weird implication rule to conclude that phi implies anything. So we really can get from not phi to phi implies anything. And we have modus ponens. We have validity of modus ponens in the usual way. But we do not have explosion in this sense. Right? You would think, oh, if I could just chain those arguments together, I would get to explosion. And that's true. But in core logic, you can't always chain arguments together in that way. Nonetheless, you have some, this is the sense in which it's paraconsistent, right? is that not anything follows from a contradiction. But you have some registering of the unacceptability of contradictions. That is, the argument from any old contradiction to frowny face is valid. Um, right, so contradictions are not acceptable, they're not good, they're not the sorts of things we like in core logic, but that doesn't mean just anything follows from them. Uh, right, so it occupies this, this sort of, this variety of paraconsistency, right? It's a very strongly non dialectist flavor of paraconsistency, is what you have in play in core logic. Um, okay, and core logic is a lot like intuitionistic logic. And this is, I think, yeah, this is the last thing I'll tell you about core logic. Um, gives you a sense how much this is like intuitionistic logic. First of all, it gives you a frowny face from some premises, if and only if intuitionistic logic with false in it now will give you a false from those premises. Right? So a set of premises is core inconsistent if and only if it's intuitionistically inconsistent. 
The core logic agrees with intuitionistic logic on what's inconsistent. Moreover, core logic agrees with intuitionistic logic on what follows from consistent premise sets. So the only difference between core logic and intuitionistic logic is in what follows from inconsistent premise sets. And there is no disagreement over which premise sets those are. Uh, it's very, very similar to intuitionistic logic uh, in these sorts of ways. And while I'm only working with the conditional negation fragment of things here today, uh, core logic as it's usually presented is a full first order language with conjunction and disjunction and your quantifiers and so on, and, and these results all extend to the full uh, first order of core logic. This is not idiosyncratic to the fragment I'm using here. Um, so we've got this thing, core logic, it's motivated in, in part by thinking about intuitionistic logic and thinking about some nice features of intuitionistic logic, but being dissatisfied with how the negation works and trying to offer a different theory of negation that's meant to improve uh, over what's possible. Intuitionistic logic plays a fun role in this thing called the Curry-Howard correspondence, which, it, again, I don't want to assume familiarity with this, but this is the kind of topic that could easily be a semester-long graduate seminar, and this is obviously not the venue to go into it next depth either. So I'm going to try to give you a, a sort of relatively rapid grace hits of uh, the Curry-Howard correspondence, which, as it's usually done, stands between intuitionistic logic on the one hand and the simply typed lambda calculus on the other. Um, and essentially, the purpose of what I'm doing here with core logic is to say, suppose we start from the Curry-Howard correspondence with intuitionistic logic and the simply typed lambda calculus. Now, let's change out intuitionistic logic for its relative, core logic. What happens on the lambda calculus side? That's the, the question, that's the sort of research question behind this talk, and uh, I'll be able to show you at least a little bit about what does happen on the lambda calculus side. But first we've got to think about the correspondence itself. So in many ways, right, so we've done the like intuitionistic core logic side of the square, now we need to do the top intuitionistic logic simply type lambda calculus side of the square, and then those things together will give us that final corner. So the curry Howard correspondence uh, connects the simply type lambda calculus to intuitionistic logic. What is the simply type lambda calculus? Well, it's a way of looking at a, a theory of, of data that comes in types and functions that can take you from bits of data to other bits of data. Um, so lambda calculus, uh, originally put together by Church, I believe the untyped is earlier than the typed lambda calculus, done as a theory of computation. Like all theories of computation, it turned out to be equivalent to all the other theories of computation. Um, this is uh, this is why Church's name is in Church's thesis, or the Church Turing thesis, um, was through the development of the untyped lambda calculus. The typed lambda calculus is a, is a variant on that, right? So it's a theory of computation, but it's not a theory of computation on just any old data. It's a theory of computation on data that comes in discrete types. So you might have a type of, you know, maybe our integers look like this, and maybe our text strings of text look like that, and maybe dates look like this, and maybe records for customers look like that. Right, you have a lot of different kinds of data, and these are separated off by types. So the types in the simply typed lambda calculus, or at least in the version of it uh, that I'll look at here, are either atomic types, which we can just say, well, we've got some stock of atomic types, like strings or integers or whatever, or bottom, because we're thinking now intuitionistically. We're out of core logic land back into intuitionistic land. Uh, right, so bottom's a type, or formed by implication from types we already have. What type is bottom? Bottom is an empty type. It's a type that nothing occupies, right? It's the, the type of things that are non-self-identical, right? the type of whatever, whatever there isn't any of. Right? Bottom is an empty type. And conditional types, arrow types, implication types are function types, right? So what is something of type phi arrow psi? It's a function, and it's a function that wants an input of type phi, and when it receives an input of type phi, it will give you an output of type psi. Right, so all our functions are constrained only to take certain types of inputs, and that is constrained only to take a single type of input, and constrained only to give a single type of output. Right, so we've got lots and lots of different function types according to what sorts of input output behavior they do. So our types, in other words, are exactly the propositions of a certain logical language. Right? Atomic, or this Folsom constant, or arrows put together from other things. Right? This is sometimes called a, a propositions as types correspondence, um, and that's why. Right? What's playing the role of our types here are exactly the propositions in the usual logical language. The correspondence goes 
several steps deeper than that. One of them is when we actually start thinking about the data that occupies these times. Right? What are the inhabitants of the times? So here's a theory that you might give of terms of various types. We'll say for every type, we'll just say we've got variables of that type. Because we want to be able to think about arbitrary members of the time. Right? So you say, OK, well, for every type phi, I've got an x of type phi and a y of type phi and a z of type phi and so on. These are just variables. And I want to say, if I have a function that is some term m with the type phi arrow psi, which remember the function type, and I have an argument of the appropriate type to serve as an input to that function, then I can apply the function to that argument. And the type of applying that function to the argument, the type of the result, will be the output type of the function. Um, you'll notice I'm indicating types of terms by doing these superscripts. Sometimes I don't write the superscripts in. The slides will quickly become completely unreadable if I included all the superscripts in. Um, so where I don't include a superscript, it's either determinable from the context or it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, officially, all these superscripts are all always floating around. Um, it's just We'll see a few big terms later that have all the superscripts in. It's, it's, they're not great to read. Um, so I've, I've just removed them off of readability. But anyway, if we have a function, we have an input of the appropriate type, then we can apply the function to the input and get an output of the appropriate type. Where do we get a function? Well, given a variable of some type phi and a term of some type psi, this is why it's called the lambda calculus, we've got this little lambda binder here. We've got lambda x m is itself a function, and the idea here is this lambda x should be understood as a variable binder. It binds all the free occurrences of x, if there are any, in the term m. So the term m might say, like, x plus 9. Like, Great, what's x? Don't know, ask someone else. Now you put a lambda in front of it, lambda x, x plus 9. Now the x is, is no longer free, it's bound, you have a name for a function. And that function will take its input and add 9 to it. Um, so the lambda here is your variable binder, and this is how you produce uh, function terms. Although, of course, you have variables of function type, because you have variables of every type. But if you want to build up function terms in some other way, you use the lambda. And then finally, we've got this sketchy explode thing. If I have a term in the empty type, then something's gone badly wrong, because it's supposed to be empty. So I'll say, if I've got a term in there, then, ah, who cares? I get, I get something to type on. Um, that might feel shady to you. If it does, that's part of the problem with intuitionistic treatments of negation. Like that shadiness is, again, that same shadiness around intuitionistic treatments of negation. You sometimes see when people are trying to justify this in, in talking about actual computational behavior here, because these terms that we're building up are, in effect, programs. Um, and when you see people try to justify this in terms of computational behavior, they sometimes say something like, well, if you've done an impossible thing, you must have superpowers so you can do anything. <laughs> right? If you've got a term of an empty type, that's amazing. You must have superpowers to have such a thing. So why not help yourself to a phi? Um, whatever phi is. That should feel shady. Um, but anyway, this is part of, of what goes on in this background and part of what the move to core logic will hopefully do something to alleviate. These terms, I just said they were programs, they're also proofs. And they're proofs in natural deduction for intuition and state logic. Right? So variables are assumptions in our proofs. You can assume any formula. You have a variable of any type. Function application is modus ponens, right? Given a conditional and its antecedent, you may conclude its consequence. So given a proof of a conditional, which is to say a term of a function type, and a proof uh, of its antecedent, which is to say a term of the appropriate input type, you can put them together via modus ponens, which is to say via function application, and get a proof of the consequent, which is to say a term of the output type. Right? It really, the match is, is that clean, right? Each component really does correspond in that nice nifty sort of way. Modulo the fact that I didn't really use most poems earlier, but as I said, I wasn't going to talk much about it. Um, okay, how do we form a function? Well, it's a conditional proof. Given an assumption, we've got a proof of that, so we may discharge the assumption, which is to say bind the variable, 
and conclude the implication. And finally, when we say, ah, it's a term of the empty type, I don't know, whatever, right? when we cry uncle, that's EFQ, that's explosion, that's anything follows from that, that false sort of move, right? So again, it's the very same sketchiness. So propositions are down here playing rules of types. Proofs, although they're written in this kind of strange termy way, are, are uh, playing the role of inhabitants of the types, of terms of programs. There's a final step, which is how do you run the programs? Uh, and this works by way of reduction. So any term at all of this form, that is where you have a function term that really has been formed with a lambda, and then you apply it to something. And that's what's called a red X, which I think is short for reducible expression. And it's reduct, you just get by substitution. You take the argument n, and you plug it into the body of the function, into the m, uh, wherever x is. Um, so that's just a substitution notation. So whenever you have a function that you can see inside, right? if you have like a variable for a function, or if you have a function that's been produced as an output from something else, then you can't really see inside it. You can't see the body of it. You can see right into that lambda term. right? You've got that lambda x, and then the body is transparently displayed as an X. Whenever you have a function that you can see inside and it's applied to something, you've got red X. And then you uh, reduce it, execute the function by plugging its argument in wherever uh, wherever it should go. That's wherever the X's are uh, in there. Um, and so now here's how reduction works. Given any old term, no matter how big, with some particular red X living inside it, you reduce the whole term by one step by just taking that little red X, replacing it with its reduct, and leave the whole rest of it alone. Right? So if you have a if you have a term that doesn't have any red X's in it, you can't reduce it. It's it's done. But if you have a big term and it has multiple different red X's in it, then to reduce it, you need to pick one of those, and you just replace the red X with the reduct and leave everything else be. And that's that's reduction. That's one step of reduction. Thing to note. The red X always matches its reduct in type. In order for this thing to be well formed, M itself has to have type uh, psi. And so the result will have type psi. Substitution always preserves type. So reduction always preserves type. And when we were building up terms, all that ever mattered for whether it was OK to build a term was the types of the various components. So if we do anything that preserves type, we're not going to move from a well-formed thing to an ill-formed thing. So the result's always well-formed. And this one-step reduction and its reflective transitive closure have some nice properties. First one is that if you've got a term and it reduces to something, that thing has the same type as where you started. Now, you always preserve type when you reduce. So if I've got a big program of type integer, that means I'm going to calculate an integer when you run me. And then I run it, I will in fact get an integer. Or at the very least, I will get another program that will calculate an integer. But it's not going to produce a date. It's not going to produce a string of text. Right? It's, it's going to do what it says. It's sort of type as Confluence. You might have choices about how to reduce a term. If it has multiple different red X's in it, you can reduce it at the first one, or at the second one, or at the third one. Those are all fine ways of reducing it. And you get different results. Confluence tells you that you can always bring those different results back together. Right? So if I've got a term M, and it can go in one step to something n, and m could also go in one step to a thing o, then somewhere out there there's a p that n and o can both calculate into. And what this tells you is that you don't really need to be too fussy about how you go about the reducing. Right? Just keep going, you'll always kind of end up matching up where, wherever you started. You can't diverge in an unrecoverable way. And then finally, you've got strong normalization. All reduction paths are finite. Um, and the reduction back here is just a choice of which way to reduce. You know, because you've got options, and then you might have more options, and then you might have more options, and then you might have more options. And strong reduction says you're always going to get to an endpoint. Just keep reducing. You will reach a point where you cannot reduce anymore. No matter how you do it, you cannot get yourself down any infinite path. There are no infinite paths here. Um, and together, that means that every single term here has a unique normal form, which you can re reach by reducing it any way you like until you can't go anymore, right? Anything that diverges will have to come back together. Everything eventually ends. So just keep doing stuff, and you end up always in the same place. Uh, and this is part of what supports thinking of these terms as programs for calculating 
inhabitants of this time. Normal forms, that is things that can't be reduced further, you can think of as the values calculated, and the reduction itself is, is program execution. So that's a tremendous amount of background. Uh, but, as I said before, right, it's the sort of two sides of the square, now we're gonna solve for how do we find the lambda calculus that fits with core logic rather than with intuition as well. Okay, propositions and types, as before. We have no thought around anymore, right? Our language for, is back to core logic. Remember, we've got atomic formulas, conditionals, and negations. We have no falsum anywhere. So there's no falsum type. And the Fraun theory is not a proposition and therefore is not a type. Right? So our types really are just <coughs> atoms, conditionals, negations. That's the, the types of data. How should we understand the conditional types? As before. How should we understand the ancient types? These are also input takers, right? But what a not fly does is it takes an input of type phi and then it crashes. Right? Core logic is, uh, or core type theory, is a type theory where programs can fail. They can crash on them. Failure is always an option. <coughs> it's nice to be able to describe what happens when things fail in a certain kind of way. And that's what core type theory gives us, right? These not flies, these terms of negation type, take inputs and crash, right? They take specific inputs, inputs of type one, but then they just crash. And the frowning phase represents a crash, right? It's not a type of data at all, it's a failure. It's a failure to come up with anything. Okay, what are our terms? Well, we start just like the simply typed lambda calculus. We have variables of each type. Variables of each type. Frowning phase is not a type. Variables of each type. Given a function term and an argument term of appropriate type, we can apply it. You get the result of the appropriate type. We can form our lambda terms as usual. So this right here is a simple form of what's sometimes called the simply type lambda calculus, now without an empty type, right? So the core type theory that I'm going to give you contains within it the usual simply type lambda calculus without an empty type. This is all there and it will all function as usual. There's just more. Here's the more. Given a variable and a frowny face term in which that variable occurs, you combine the variable with a lambda to get yourself a negation term, and you combine that variable with a lambda to get yourself a function term that takes that variable as input and claims that it will produce any old output you like. And these, just as before, right, this corresponds directly to our, uh, uh, the rules of the core proof system, right? These terms are proofs. Here, though, it's interpreted as, look, if M is going to crash, and it's not an M in it, then we can note that it does. We can note that if you give me a phi, I will crash. That is, we can assign you a type not phi. But, if it crashes, we can also pretend it's going to output just any old sum. That's that strange conditional rule that I remarked on earlier on. Right? Where from the frowny phase, you can introduce a conditional with an arbitrary consequence. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, you probably wouldn't, right? If you know that it crashes, you would probably want to mark it accurately with this crashes. Well, as we all know, sometimes things crash that you didn't intend for to crash, right? Sometimes things can promise you, give me a string and I'll give you back an integer. And you go, okay, and then you give it a string and then it crashes and you go, hey, you promised me an integer. Yeah, it's tough luck, life's like that. And so of course type theory gives us some grip on cases where life's like that. Right, where things can go wrong, where programs can make you a promise, if you give me a string, I'll give you back an integer, but where that promise just turns out not to be true, because inside the program crashes. And you might not want things to be like that, but sometimes they are, and this gives us a grip on describing. Uh, and then finally, and this corresponds to the negation elimination rule of the proof system, if you've got something that says it will crash when you give it a phi, and you in fact give it a phi, it crashes. Right, the, the negation, uh, types are honest. They say that if it says it crashes, it will. Uh, so all of these term formers are read directly off the rules of the natural deduction system uh, in the core logic case, just as they are in the more usual simply type lambda calculate case from intuitionistic logic. Uh, and these are the kinds of results we get for forming terms. So the terms end up a little weird. Red X's and their redux are 
as before wink wink, um, which is to say a redex is anything where you've got a lambda term that you can see inside, you've got a, a proper lambda term applied to an argument. The reduct is done just by plugging in, and you plug in that argument for the x as it is. Uh, the reason I said wink wink is depending on which of these things are typed or not typed, because we now have things around without types, terms with crown faces on, right? They don't have types. So depending on which of these things have types or don't have types, and depending on other things, there's essentially three different variants that are masked here. So let's look at these three different variants individually. We might have the good old-fashioned normal case, right? We've got a function type. It's really honestly going to give us the output in there. We give it the input, and it really does honestly give us the output. That's the usual case. That's all we had in the simply pipe lambda calculus that first one. That's all I'm looking We've also got the deceptive function type case. Right? It says it's going to give us something, but really it's hiding a crash. And then when we execute it, it does crash. Right? That second line is that deceptive line. And then we've got the third one where it tells us it's going to crash. It tells us not five. It says I'm going to crash if you give me a five, and you give it a five, and then it crashes. Right? So the top line, bottom line are the honest cases. The middle line is the deceptive case. They all fit the same pattern of red X's and redux that we've got. They all just work by substitution and so on. But there's just different ways that can play out now because we've got extra options floating around. And this means that things are going to get a little bit delicate. So remember the simply type lambda calculus. I said, look, once we know the difference between red X's and redox, it's easy to reduce a whole term. Right? You just find a red X in it, take that red X, replace it with its redox, and leave everything else alone. That worked because all that well formedness depended on in the simply type lambda calculus was what types things had. And the uh, moving from a red X to a redox always preserved type. So we're always replacing something with something of the same type. So we always preserve well formedness. Well, reduction doesn't always preserve type. Some things can claim to be a bit of data, but they turn out just to crash. That's one reason we will no longer be able to just swap red X's for redux in place, leaving the context based. Not an option anymore. The other reason is a bit more subtle, but it's also there. Reduction can remove free variables. This was possible in the simply type lambda calculus too, just didn't cause any problems there. Um, so if you think up here, take, suppose there are no free x's in n. Well, then when we substitute n for x in n, there aren't any x's to substitute it for. We just throw out the n, basically. We just end up with n itself. So if there were variables here that are free in n, but not free in m, then those variables are no longer free in the readout. That wasn't a problem in the simply type lambda calculus because there was never any requirement that various variables occur free. So if we move to variables not occurring free, and no biggie, right? They happen to occur free, but they didn't have to. But in core type theory, sometimes variables do have to occur free. And so when we lose free occurrences of variables, that itself can make things not well formed. So for these two reasons, we can't do reduction in core type theory just by saying swap a red X for its reduct wherever it happens and leave everything else alone. Not an option. Just to make sure I got it, yep. the, the fact that variables do have to occur there relates to the no vacuous discharge. Yes, that rule. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if you think about this as reducing a proof, right? if you've got some open assumptions at the top of a proof, but then they get discharged later on, if you now reduce internal to that, and you lose those open assumptions, you might force yourself to where you have, must discharge vacuously. Mm -hmm. But now that's disallowed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly what's happening here. So we've got these two risks. And what this means is that one step reduction of a term is just not anywhere near as simple as it was before. Right? You can't just leave everything else alone and do it. Uh, and this, I put an exclamation mark here. This is a really weird feature for a uh, uh, term calculus like this to have. There's a very, very well-studied class of term calculi called term rewriting systems. You would basically expect anything in this broad area to be a term rewriting system. 
you would certainly expect anything this closely related to the simply typed lambda calculus to be a term rewriting system. Core type theory is not a term rewriting system, and this is the reason. Term rewriting systems must have that feature where you can reduce in place, leave the context alone. Core type theory just doesn't have that feature. So although a lot of stuff from the theory of term rewriting systems is useful for these critters, you can't just take things for granted because this is not a term rewriting system. How do you reduce one step? Leave the context alone when you can, and otherwise just get in there with a the machete. That's the, the basic idea. Throw out what you have to throw out. Leave what you can leave. Um, we can go through the details. I don't want to go through the details, but I'll give you a, just a look at these two first bullet points to give you the sense of what it is. Right? Suppose we have an application where you have M applied to N, and we're wondering what that reduces to. Well, suppose we do a reduction inside M. Well, if that has preserved the type, then we just do it inside M and keep it going. Right? So M here might be a negation type or it might be a function type, either way. If we preserve that type, then the application remains well formed. So just leave it. We can leave it alone, so we do leave it alone. On the other hand, M might have crashed. So if I've got a function applied to its argument say, and I try to figure out what the function is and it crashes, I can't apply it to its argument. There's nothing to apply. So what do I do? Well, I just remember the crash. Throw out the argument. Don't care what the argument was. I don't have a function. It just crashed. Doesn't matter what I was going to apply it to. And there's details, but similarly for the other stuff. Right? The idea is if you can leave well enough alone, you do leave well enough alone. If you cannot leave well enough alone, then you throw out the next layer of content and then check whether you can leave well enough alone above that. Right? So this is inductive on the formation of the context, is the way you do one-step reduction. Rather than just leave everything else alone and do it, you have to actually walk the full structure of the term to do a single step of reduction. Better right um, but all you'll ever do as you go is preserve things or throw things out. Right? Nothing changes or gets tweaked around, nothing turns into something else. It's just each bit of structure that you come across either stays put or disappears. Yeah. So we look at the details of that in Q&A if you like, but that's that's the core idea. So to look at ah, ah, ah I said core. Um, so let's just take a look at one example here of reduction. This is what the terms start to look like when you actually annotate them in full. Sorry. Um, so what's going on here? We've got this inner thing, which is going to apply a not phi to a phi. Here are the variables, and that of course will crash. Now we've got a lying function term that says, oh, give me a phi and I'll give you a theta. When in fact what it's going to do is use the little not phi it's got inside it and crash. Give me a phi, I'll give you a theta. And then we assume we have a phi, so we've applied that there, it gives us a theta. So what do we have? We have a function term that we can see inside, applied to an argument, and that makes it a red. We reduce by substituting that argument, that's z, in for the input of the function, in for the log, and as a result, we actually get the crash. Hooray! I mean, it's a crash, it's a ground effect, but still, it works. Um, that's a case where nothing has to be thrown out, everything works as usual. If you want to see a case where something gets thrown out, look at the second example. Imagine we had a vacuous binding into that, into this whole red X. Right, it says give me a W and I'll give you that back. But all it's really going to do is ignore the W because there is no W here. Right. That, that's fine, that's legit. You can vacuously bind into a typed term. And it does. Well, then that whole thing would reduce. You can't vacuously bind into a, a frowny face. So once the red X reduces to a frowny face, that binder into it has to vanish. Right. It's trying to vacuously bind into a frowny face. There is no vacuous binding. The graph graph. And then there's a more complex example yet again. Um, well, I want to just close by saying, what, what on earth is this thing like, the result of the whole thing? What does is, what is core type theory act like? What does it do? Well, I already told you it's not a term rewriting system, um, which unfortunately blocks using a lot of the results that you might like to use to explore these sorts of critters. Well, reduction doesn't preserve time. We've already seen that. Even the move from a red X to its redux doesn't always preserve time. So one of the first key properties we looked at is the simply type lambda calculus, that reduction always preserves time, fails. But we've got 
of potentially useful weakening of that problem. Right? It's not like just anything goes here. The only failures of preservation you ever get are going from a type to a ground effect. You never get anything that goes from one type to another. You never get anything that goes from a frowny face to a type. Right? As you reduce, if you start from a type term, you might end up with a term of that type. Or you might end up with a frowny face. And there are no other possibilities. If you start with a frowny face and you reduce it, you will only ever get more frowny faces. Right? You can keep calculating after a crash, but a crash is a crash. And as you calculate something that isn't yet, hasn't yet crashed, either it does what it says it will do, or it crashes. Those are the only possibilities. So we've got some of the virtues of, of preservation here without having preservation itself. This one's weirder. Reduction's not conflict. Depending on which red X you pick to reduce at, you might get different answers. Um, so here's an example. Look at this as like, here are two halves in here. We've got this little thing and then like this big thing. So what's this little, and then there's something binding into it. What's this little thing going to do? It wants an input uh, psi, which it's going to call x, and it's going to ignore that and just give you a y of type beta. That's all it's going to do. And then we give it this big whole messy gigantic input. But it's going to ignore that input. So what happens if we work on it here? We actually give it this big whole messy input. Well, it ignores that input and just gives back the y. And we've still got our binding coming in, so that's what we get. That's if we reduce this red x, the big red x. We take that little thing that's going to ignore its x input, and we actually give it an input to ignore. It proceeds to ignore it. But this whole big mess that I was just encouraging you not to look at, I encourage you to look at it now, and there's a red x in it. And the red x in it is going to crash. Right? Living in here, you've got this thing, it's going to take a not row as an input, and then it's going to apply it to a row and crash. And here we are giving it a not row as an input. So if we try to apply the function to its argument, the function ignores the argument. But if we try to calculate the argument, it crashes. And so if we try to calculate the argument first, we get that crash, and then there's still this outer binding going into it. Yeah. Disguising the crash, right? But it has happened internally. Um, and those can't be brought back together, right? Here's two different results from one thing. They're actually both in normal form. Neither of them can be reduced further. So we definitely do not have confluence. We do not have a way of pulling things back together. Also, note that neither of these has yet really crashed, right? This one's going to, but it hasn't yet. So you get non-confluence even in the absence of having a crash yet. Right? Cause just because something's going to crash is enough to create that sort of non-confluence. Um, another example. Here's a weird one. Let beta equivalence be the least equivalence relation that includes reduction. The beta equivalence is very, very useful for exploring all kinds of systems like this. It's a very, very common relation to use. Here it's trivial. Everything's beta equivalent to everything else. Why? Because I can take a program that will either produce its input or crash in a particular way, and I can apply it to just about anything I like. And so it might produce that input again, or it might crash in a particular way, but that crash would be the same way for each input. So each everything is equal to everything else kind of via that particular crash of this weird program. So again, the general theory of term rewriting systems is useless here because this isn't a term rewriting system. I shouldn't say useless. You can imitate some of the proofs of the theorems. You just can't appeal to the theorems directly. Um, but here, this thing being, let's be honest, broken, really blocks a lot of proofs you might like to give various properties of things because they depend on beta equivalence actually recording something of interest. And here, beta equivalence does not record anything of interest. And this is essentially down to the non positive might be nice to find a weakening of confluence that reduction does obey, right? We found weakenings of preservation that reduction obeys. Might be nice to find a weakening of confluence that it obeys. Uh, here for some it doesn't obey. It's not confluent in closed terms. It's not confluent but for frowny faces where you say like, okay, if it reduces to things that aren't frowny faces, then those come back together. That's not true. It's not confluent for terms of atomic type. Is it 
confluent but for Fermi phases on closed terms of atomic type? I don't know. There'd be, there'd be something there, as it were, to be worth knowing. Or is there, suppose we don't allow ourselves to reduce arbitrarily, suppose we constrain ourselves in some way around reduction. Right? You might think of a reduction strategy as like given a term a unique way of reducing it, in which case the question of confluence can't arise because there's only one path you could have taken. But you might rule out some ways of reducing and still leave yourself choices and find ways that are confluent to them. I don't know how to do that, I don't know whether that's possible. Um, but there are at least some weakenings of confluence that we might try to aim towards it. Just question one. It is, though, strongly normalized. That goes through. Every reduction path is still final. Um, which is, that's a bit of a relief. It's nice to prove something rather than just that nothing was ever there. Um, so every reduction path is finite. The proof is an old one and necessarily an old one. There's lots of fun newfangled proofs of normalization these days. Normalization is much easier to prove in the 21st century than it was in the 70s. But those newfangled proofs don't work because they all depend on beta equivalence, which is completely useless here. So you gotta go back to tape. Uh, but you can, in fact, get the, get the old proofs through just fine. Um, there really is not much in the way of comment. You can just lift the old tape proof and, and put it down and it works. So here's the rough idea. You define some notion of strongly computable term by induction on the types themselves, and then in a clever way, shows simultaneously that all the strongly computable terms are strongly normalizing and that all the terms are strongly computable. Um, so it's an old proof of strong normalization. It works. The new ones don't work. Um, but it's true. It only takes one. Um, so the thing is strongly normalizing. So what the result core programs always terminate, but whether or not they crash and what result they produce if they don't crash can depend on detail of how they're executed, um, which frankly seems a little odd, uh, uh, at least if you're me. OK. What, what's the lesson for takeaway here? Well, one is that core logic is really not very far from intuitionistic logic, as we saw at the start. It's, it's super tightly related. But their associated type theories are not much like each other at all. Really, really basic features of the simply type lambda calculus do not extend to the calculus that's associated with core logic in a similar way. Um, it's not a term rewriting system. You don't have preservation. You don't have confluence. OK, you've got strong normalization, but there's a lot of differences going on here. So one thing this suggests to me is that this move back and forth between logical systems on the one hand and term calculi on the other can be a very useful way for recognizing and detecting properties of a logical system that might not be obvious when you just look at like what arguments are valid or what are the rules of proof we have. If you look at core logic and intuitionistic logic as logical systems right next to each other, you know, oh, that's, that's basically the same thing. There's a little bit of tweaking around negation. Yeah, I mean, I see the differences, but like, you know, basically looks good. You come over into this world, it's just a different lens of looking at the same things, and they don't look anything like. Right? You say, okay, well, one's contained in the other, but all this extra stuff in the other is producing all kinds of wild and woolly results that we didn't have going on in the first world. So this suggests to me that this sort of term calculus lens can be a really useful lens for looking at various kinds of non-classical logic. It also suggests to me that this method of, let me find a weird logic and jam it through this correspondence and see what pops out on the term calculus side, could be an interesting way of finding some weird term calculi that people wouldn't otherwise stumble on. Right? If you picked up the simply typed lambda calculus and started asking yourself, what variations could I make on this? You'd never get this thing. This is a weird thing. Right? So in terms of finding interesting critters in that area, critters that fall outside of the scope of what's known, known general results, like the general results about term rewriting systems, making a little variation on the logic side rather than on the term calculus can turn out to have a huge ramification in the term calculus and can help us find things that we wouldn't otherwise have seen. And sometimes things that old proof techniques, like Tate's proof of strong normalization, still work on, even though they're very unlike uh, the sorts of systems that, that those results work on. Um, but finally, I think there's something here that speaks to a, an old comment of, of Girard. Girard said that a, a logic without cut elimination is like a car without an engine. And what he had in mind is precisely the Curry Howard correspondence and the way in which cut elimination or normalization corresponds to program execution. Right? That was the, the engine he had in mind. I think core type theory shows that that's wrong. Right? Core logic does not have cut elimination in any sort of meaning. 
So computation proceeds just fine, right? It's different, but it works. And this is, I think, basically what Tennant's been saying all along. Um, when Tennant's run into objections to core logic, always based on the lack of cut, he's got responses that he goes to that are, are pretty direct. And I think those responses, one, are right, and two, shown to be right, by looking at this calculation that happens within core type theory. So this is, this is not news, I think, um, but it's just a different way of looking at how Tennant's defense of the loss of cut has in fact been onto something. So I don't think uh, the core logic is, is like a car without an engine in any sense. It's a car without a steering in it. <laughs> it goes. We don't know where it's going to end up, but it definitely goes. And so that's what I wanted to do. 